Hi, and welcome to the Vet Dental Show, where we dig deep into everything in general veterinary practice, dentistry, and have fun doing it. Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. Courtney uh, has a good question. In, um, in case 10, if you have an owner that wants to pursue root canal, how long can the owner wait uh, to be seen by a specialist? really is such that most of the time when we see that there is a fractured tooth, it's not the owner doesn't see it. It's recognized in practice. Uh, and if it is recognized by the owner, unless they see it happen, they're probably not going to recognize it uh, in most instances. It's usually going to be picked up in a dentistry procedure on an exam at your office. So many, most of the time, we don't know when it happened. Uh, and most of the time, owners will come in and they'll say, and we had multiple cases this week that was exactly this. Most of the time, what, what actually happens, the owner comes in and he says, yeah, he fractured this tooth a month ago or six weeks ago, and we do the x-rays, and that tooth has been fractured since that six-year-old dog has been 10 months of age. So it's, and we can tell because of the root canal size. So it, it's not something that the owners are going to know unless they are there. They see the bleeding, uh, the dog uh, bites down and uh, they, they uh, scream on a hard chew toy or something and the owners uh, detect it. So um, the, to, to answer your, your question, you're probably not going to know when that happened. So if you do know when it happens, and there was another question about this, about you doing vital pulpotomies on these uh, that, that are, are fresh fractures within 24 hours, and I'll address that as well. But if we, if we do catch those uh, within 24 hours, some of our colleagues recommend that um, we still do a root canal. Uh, and I think the majority of uh, colleagues recommend we still do a root canal because we don't know the extent of the uh, contamination of that canal. And also, Brooke Nemec did a study where he did uh, vital pulp uh, therapy on teeth that needed crown reduction under sterile circumstances. And there was a lot of those that did not play out to be valuable down the road. So even under sterile circumstances, that procedure uh, has not proven to be uh, one that we usually do. Under the, under the scrutiny of the specialist, uh, it could be tried, uh, and we, we might do that if it was something that happened immediately, but we just, we just don't see them immediately, especially because we're only in Atlanta once a month and we're only in Orlando once a month. If you know when it happens, uh, the best thing to do is analgesics, maybe a short course of a couple days of, uh, of an antibiotic, amoxicillin, uh, cephalexin, something like that, um, <clears throat> to handle maybe any surface contamination where, uh, you can help the pulp out a little bit, uh, but NSAIDs until they can get in. And dogs are not generally going to show that they're uncomfortable, even though they are, you can bet they are uh, with that pulp exposure, especially in a young dog where it's a big piece of pulp. <clears throat> but um, we want to get them in, Courtney, in response to your question, as soon as we can, but it's, not, it's, it's almost never anything urgent unless we, we have... Uh, uh, n we have known immediate pulp exposure that um, they, they know happened right then. So um, hope that answers your question. So Stephanie, um, just a general question I encountered throughout all the cases. Uh, as a general rule, when you when you suit your when would you suit your gum and when would you not suit your gum? How about ones with tooth root abscesses? Sometimes don't close. Not sure if that's right or wrong. Um, but worry about fistulas forming uh, and gum not healing after extraction. So let's, um, let's address the last part of that question first. When we have a 
tooth root abscess, that's really not considered, that's really not a true abscess. That, that's where the byproducts of pulp necrosis and or bacteria have destroyed the bone. Uh, we have replacement with granulation tissue. We do not have a true abscess. All of that gets to the point where it breaks through the bone and then it, it affects the tissue. When it affects the tissue, that's when it becomes purulent. Not until then. We have a unusual condition called a phoenix abscess in humans where there is an actual abscess, but those are extremely painful in humans. They are uh, very, uh, I think they're actually rare. Uh, I don't, I, I would, I, I recall that they're not even very uncommon. I think they're rare. <clears throat> so we, we, do, we just don't see a true abscess in our patients. Um, uh, but the suborbital fistula, uh, to, go, to go back to uh, the correct terminology, the suborbital fistula is eliminated once the tooth is extracted because all the infection that's in that tooth root or all the inflammation that's in the tooth root and the bone are removed when the tooth is extracted. And we will go in uh, from the tooth side, we'll use our periosteal elevator to curette up in that defect and remove any debris that we can from the tooth side intraorally. We'll also go in, shave that area, clean it up, uh, and clean it up with lavage of chlorhexidine in the actual cutaneous defect as well. Uh, we don't put those patients on antibiotics unless there is an extension of osteomyelitis that we see that we can't treat that's extensive. So um, good question. Now, going on to your second question, we, we do not, the, the only time that we really don't suture is when we are doing extractions of single rooted teeth, or in some cases, premolars of single rooted teeth uh, that are small that we've sectioned and we can extract without a flap. Uh, and those would be fractures. If they have periodontal disease, we really need to get up in there and clean out the defect. That may not require a huge flap in, say, the, the, the case of a second maxillary premolar, uh, where you've got a two-rooted tooth and you've got, say, 50% bone gone, you could do a small um, flap just using your periosteal elevator to separate, excuse me, the, uh, the attached gingiva from the, the bone and then section and remove as two individual tooth roots and then go in there and clean uh, with your diamond football burr and then uh, and then close those with with uh, sutures after those have been cleaned. The other instance that we would not uh, uh, we would not now now again if those are if they're not perio and you're extracting that and you can extract those as simple extractions and you don't have inflamed gingiva you don't have tissue in there uh, you could extract both of those maxillary tooth roots without a flap and um, in some cases because that maxillary bone is a lot more. Um, uh, cancellous than the cortical bone in the mandible, uh, making those mandibular canine extractions difficult. And I generally don't do those unless I do a flap to take bone away. So um, that would kind of be the only case that you do that without um, uh, with with a fracture without periodontal disease. Is that second first or second maxillary premolar? Um, you, know, you get back to that third premolar, and there's a lot of maxillary bone that is thick, especially around the uh, distal root. So mainly that's reserved for incisors where we do get a lot of fractures. We get a lot of fractured incisors that don't have perio. And with those, we want to use our simple extraction technique without a flap that will allow us to elevate those. And um, then we just leave a blood clot there. We don't suture those extraction sites if the gingiva looks good, if it's just a fracture and there's no perio. So Lee, uh, un uncomplicated crown root fractures like the maxillary P4 slab fractures get to stay in. So um, it, she's, she's asking, does the fragment stay in 
She's been taking wonder about perio. You always want to remove those. And most of the time when there is a slab, not always, but most of the time when there is a slab, there's uh, usually a perio component that's going to be there then and possibly going forward. And if it progresses apically up the tooth root and uh, it's a complicated crown fracture, even though the tooth root w would let us do a root canal, we, we would not do a root canal on those teeth that are compromised. Some of those slabs uh, go all the way up half or more up the root, and those are not going to be manageable periodontal-wise going forward. So if there's any question, um, we use our periodontal probe, and we can feel uh, where where that slab has gone up a lot of times. Sometimes we'll uh, we'll try to try to do a little flap and look up under there and see uh, before we make that decision. But a lot of those are just way too severe. And you can look at that you can look at that slab uh, once you take it out, and you can place it back where it was on top of the marginal gingiva to see how far that's gone up if the slab is still there. Many times it's not. Many times the fracture's there and the slab has worked its way off. <clears throat> so, But if the slab's there, you can tell how far that goes up and make a decision whether that might even be worth referring uh, for a root canal. If it's gone way up, uh, it's, it's not going to be a candidate. But yes, you want to take those out. Um, if it's uncomplicated and you can do uh, you want you want this dentin to be this would be where you'd have a have a uh, dentin chalk trail in all likelihood. Um, this probably would would not be healed dentin underneath here. This is probably all exposed as well, and uh, so you would you would want to be able to use a bonding agent after you clean that out and restore it. So that is a that's a specialty procedure. You, you, unless you've had an advanced course in restorations, you would not want to approach that. If I had that tooth and it was an uncomplicated crown fracture and it was that much involved, I would also uh, uh, put a crown on that tooth. Way too much uh, exposure to expect that to last with a restoration, uh, especially on that tooth. So um, hopefully that hopefully that approaches that for you uh, fairly fairly well. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review, and take a picture of that with your cell phone, and then post it on our Facebook page, and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. And one is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next. And the link will be in the show notes on the website, The Vet Dental Show. And we'll get you in and get you a 30-minute, 40-minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home and then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.